Lee Waters. Thank you so much for joining the World Happiness Agora. Uh, if there is somebody who knows about positive psychology and positive education, that's you. <laughs> what's going on? Why is, what's going on? Why, why is this becoming a tsunami around the world for good? Good question. Um, well, I mean, I wish I had a, a sort of more positive answer to start that question on why have we seen such a growth in the movement of positive education? And um, unfortunately, the major trigger for more and more schools across the world deliberately and strategically building well-being into what it is they teach students is just a rising rate of global youth mental illness. The World Health Organization recent statistics show that somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of young people across the world are experiencing mental illness. Um, that's really sad um, but what we also know about that is that it's underreported because it's very difficult to collect these kinds of statistics at a global level. You know, there are countries who don't collect these statistics. The countries who do collect these statistics do so in, in varied ways. We still have a lot of shame around mental illness. So young people under-reporting their symptoms. Even with the under-report, the World Health Organization is suggesting somewhere between 10 to 20% of young people globally experiencing mental illness. It's very sad. The, Average age of onset for depression uh, globally is 14. And half of all mental illness begins at the age of 14. And that, it's just such a young age. I mean, I have a 15 year old son myself. So I know how, and I have 12 year old daughter, you know, so I'm kind of right in that age bracket of when the brain is the most vulnerable to developing mental illness. Suicide is the number two leading cause of death globally for teenagers and that just breaks my heart um, because it's preventable and you know we look at a lot of countries my own country Australia 26 percent of teenagers experiencing mental illness you look at um, US Canada England New Zealand Israel Germany you know th these are the countries that are kind of collecting that data and they're all saying the same thing you know approximately a quarter of our young people are suffering and they're in pain, they're in darkness. Um, so what's happened as a result of that, of course, is that uh, schools are finding it difficult, difficult to really help students learn to their full capacity. It's very hard to learn to your full capacity when you're also carrying along depression or anxiety or um, compulsive thoughts around self-harm or you're um, addicted. It's very hard to learn effectively. And so what I think schools have been very, um, I don't know, I guess mature in taking on the responsibility, which was traditionally a health sector responsibility. And now the education sector has really come on board and said, we need a multi-sectorial approach to this. Um, and more and more schools across the world are readily taking on the um, responsibility of saying, we're not just here to be academic institutions and to build the academic knowledge and skills of the young people, but we're also here to be an institution that can help cultivate a mental health toolkit for young people. So it's a very positive movement. Um, it's come out of darkness. It's come out as a, come out of a, a reaction to darkness, um, but it is a very positive movement. There are elements to the movement that are very proactive. You, you take together that kind of burning platform of uh, global youth mental illness, and then you add that to a lot of the science that's coming through now in fields like education and neuroscience and cognitive uh, science showing that um, a lot of the key principles of positive psychology, how it is that we cultivate positive emotions, how it is that we cultivate connection, how it is that we cultivate resilience, that these are not only pathways to mental health, it turns out they're also key pathways to good learning. Um, good academic learning, we tend to think of learning as a very sort of cerebral, intellectual, academic, cognitive process. And it turns out we're really wrong, actually. And, and the, late, the last sort of decade of neuroscience is really clearly showing us that um, we are biological creatures that feel before we think. So if we want to engage in the full height of our cognitive capacity, we need to take care of our emotional well-being. And Schools are leveraging off that. Schools are recognising that if they want their students to do well academically, then 
they need to also create environments of well-being. And that, you know, you're right in saying that it is a global movement. It's, it's, a, it's a, for me, it's a really, really exciting movement to be involved in. And, um, you know, I have the good fortune, obviously, I'm like way over the other side of the world in, in Australia. My own country has really been a front runner um, in this. But I'm, but I'm also very lucky to, in today's day and age, to be able to connect with lots of different people and lots of different countries, yourself included, in this webinar. And it really is, it's, it's become a very, it's much a global movement. The, um, it's being endorsed by, you know, all of the kind of major international organisations, World Bank, World Health Organisation, UNESCO, United Nations. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperative Development, OECD, you know, all of these major kind of thought leaders that um, give us information about how it is that we should change and lead our society are all producing reports to say that schools can be what I call dual institutions. So both an academic institution and a well-being enhancing institution. Um, the latest OECD research, which was done a couple of years ago now, looking at 37 countries across the world, found that 70% of those countries have now explicitly built into their national curriculum frameworks the, the benchmark that schools are there not only to enhance cognitive knowledge, but also to build social and emotional uh, skills in their students. So it's become, it's become a global movement and you know, we hope that with time, schools can play a role in starting to change the trajectory of the statistics that, that we're seeing at the moment with youth mental illness. So, um, I feel that this light that is born out of darkness is, is providing many tips and many tools uh, to mm. teachers around the world, psychologists. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you summarize yeah. what are the key takeaways and what are the key learnings as a front runner uh, of this positive education and positive psychology movement? Yes, you've just asked me a really big <laughs> question. Um, and so I feel like I wanna answer that sort of at two levels with your permission. One is kind of what, you know, what are schools actually doing? What, is it, what does positive education look like on the ground in a classroom? And then the, the other, layer to your question, summarizing, you know, what are we finding? What are the outcomes? And so what does it look like? And then, you know, is it having an impact? Um, and look, it, it looks like lots of different things. Obviously, context makes a difference. Culture makes a difference. Gender makes a difference. The type of school makes a difference. So I want to qualify my answer with that, that it, it can look different in different schools and, and it should look different in different schools. Having said that, there are some universal positive education interventions that are really, to my knowledge, are being applied in many schools um, across the world, in South America, in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East. Um, and these are schools that I've visited and, and traveled to and or know about through research or case studies. And so it's some really basic, I like to think of psychological literacy, you know, it's just basic psychological literacy that we're teaching young people, kindergarten students, preschool students, right through until elementary, middle school, senior school students, practices around gratitude, for example, and how it is that we train our brain to notice and appreciate the positive things that are happening in our life, not to artificially deny darkness or challenge for a young person, um, but to give them another perspective. You know, we know that gratitude is a key part of resilience and that those people who are going through some pretty awful times. There's been research on people who have um, degenerative diseases. There's been research on people who have mental illness. There's, there's researchers on uh, survivors of natural disasters, um, research from uh, children who survived abuse, child abuse, that if they're able to find ways to notice and appreciate the small things in their life, and maybe it's the care from another person, maybe it's the sunshine on their back, maybe it's um, an interest or a hobby that they have, that this, it doesn't take away the, the struggles, but it helps you to step back and kind of look at your struggles with a broader perspective and know that there are, there are still good things in your life. So gratitude is a big practice that's really being spread through a lot of schools. Character strength is another big practice. And um, 
the use of models like the values in action model and the Gallup model to connect young people to their own strengths. And everyone has strengths. You know, the evolutionary psychologists are really clear in helping us to understand that you have strengths, Luis, I have strengths, everyone has strengths. By virtue of the fact that you are a member of the human species, you have strengths. And it was our strengths that allowed us to survive as a human species. If you think about our ancestors out on the savannah, their physical strengths, their physical strengths allowed our species to survive because it was their physical strengths that allowed them to defend themselves against a predator, to um, find, you know, a, a, a food source. It, our intellectual strengths helped us to survive as a species, you know, in addition to kind of having our physical strengths to help us in that mortal battle and to find a food source, our intellectual strengths as a species, it was our intellectual strengths that helped us to figure out how to create fire, for example, um, find a new food source, cultivate and, and make tools. Uh, and then you have your, our sort of strengths of humanity. So these are my favorite types of strengths, love, compassion, empathy, kindness, altruism. These strengths were built into us as a species because they created social connection. They created a social glue. If we didn't have these uh, strengths to motivate us to connect with each other, it would have been very difficult for us to survive. So the evolutionary psychologists are very clear and very convincing in saying everyone has strengths. And what's been delightful in the positive education movement is using schools and curriculums to connect people, young people with their strengths at an earlier age, rather than I think, you know, what happened, what's happened to many of us as adults is we learn about our strengths through trial and error. Um, and often we actually don't even learn about our strengths. There's this whole phenomenon called strength blindness. You know, there are, there are many people who are very good at seeing their weaknesses, um, but even as grown adults don't appreciate or understand and therefore utilize and harness their own strengths. So connecting young people with their strengths through these strengths framework and strengths exercises is a, another example of the how. Third example of the how is mindfulness. That's, that's really taken off. And in fact, um, Raya Owens and myself have just uh, recently um, had an article accepted into the Journal of Positive Psychology. It'll be published sometime this year. We've, we reviewed over the last 15 years, uh, the positive psychology interventions that have been done with young people, young people in schools and young people in a clinical context. So I I'm sort of come from the positive education perspective and uh, Rhea comes from the clinical psychology perspective. And one of the things we found in that review paper was this massive rise of mindfulness, the application of mindfulness and teaching mental stillness to young people, teaching them how to understand their inner emotional landscape, how to engage in breathing techniques that help them to re-regulate and calm down their, <clears throat> their nervous system, for example. So mindfulness is huge. It's made a huge push into schools as a formal curriculum, but also just as a practice. I was at a school recently and um, they have a particular, they have particular corridors and hallways in their schools that are now known as mindfulness corridors or mindfulness hallways. So fascinating. You're walking along with these students, everyone's chatting, and then, you know, they turn the corner and they walk down a particular hallway and everyone just goes quiet. And so, you know, whenever you're just walking for that two minutes in that space, it's a, it's a time of peace and it's a time of stillness and quiet. And so that's a way where it's not necessarily teaching about mindfulness. It's just creating spaces and practices where mindfulness is present in the daily life of a school. So I feel like I've talked for a lot, but um, there's some three examples of the how. And then the second part of your question really is, what are we seeing in terms of is this having an impact? And lots of work now, two decades, well, actually three decades, if you include the social and emotional learning movement, you know, which really was really such a forerunner for positive education, um, three decades of research on what happens when we equip young people with these positive practices and with teaching them about their emotions and equipping them with uh, social skills. The, the initial research sort of three decades ago was really looking at how does that reduce ill being? 
So I'm not going to go forward with that the question. Would you have met the race of shape? Would you see some jobs of anxiety? Would you see some jobs of stress? Would you see some bullying? Um, would you see some public behavior in the classroom? So, very, very beneficial effect if you're a teacher in a classroom and if you're the student. I think what where positive education came in and, and, and slightly kind of expanded the the outcomes in the research question was to say it's very helpful that these programs are reducing ill being but the field of positive psychology is is also interested in how do we increase well-being um, and I think one of the biggest findings that the field of positive psychology more generally has shown us in in the last well we're sort of two decades old now um, if you if you take Marty's uh, APA speech one of the biggest findings we found is that the absence of illness is not the same as the presence of wellness and um, taking away negative things is not the same as enhancing and building and cultivating positive states that we actually need both of those pathways. Um, I know in my book uh, and in some of my blogs, I've talked about my own uh, journey, um, being raised in an abusive family, struggling with an eating disorder as a teenager, um, suffering from anxiety and depression in my early adult years and working really hard training to be a psychologist and working with uh, psychiatrists and psychologists overcoming a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder overcoming an eating disorder overcoming anxiety and depression i found myself in my early 30s no longer suffering from symptoms of mental illness and and that was <laughs> such a relief such a relief to to not not wonder when I woke up each morning, what is today going to be like? You know, is this going to be a dark day? Is this going to be an anxious day? But that didn't make me a uh, like happy, healthy, zestful, vibrant person. It made me a person who was no longer ill, who no longer had symptoms of ill being. And the absence of ill being is not the presence of well being. Not in my own journey, I found myself in this sort of psychological limbo. You know, I wasn't experiencing ill being, but I wasn't really experiencing well being either. And um, so, building up your well being as an individual and in a classroom requires different activities. That's where we turn to things like gratitude and character strength and mindfulness in conjunction with stress reduction, anger management, um, those more traditional approaches. And what we're finding when we deliberately and intentionally put in place these more positive psychology oriented practices in school, that yes, it does reduce symptoms of ill being for young people, but importantly, it also expands and amplifies states of well-being. Um, common outcomes include things like high levels of life satisfaction in teenagers, high levels of engagement with school, greater sense of self-confidence, more hope, more optimism, more positive emotions, um, and importantly, a greater sense of resilience, the, the ability to make the most of life when it's going well, which is the hope and the optimism piece, but also to be able to bounce back more quickly when life is challenging. And it doesn't, it's science, so um, we can't say that universal for every student, um, it benefits students differently, but, but certainly now three decades of fairly consistent research to show that when we intentionally bring these things into the school environment, they have an impact on the mental health of young people. Wow, I love, I love the answer. I think that we can structure <laughs> all, all the tips and all, the, all the, the amazing response that you gave and we can actually make a, a really interesting summary. I feel very identified with you because I have two kids, two 15 and 12. Um, oh, snap, and <laughs> high five, woohoo. <laughs> So I know I, we are experiencing, you know, we are living in, in this world, gaming of uh, online social networks that we, oh. that we still need to figure out uh, how it's, it's going to have an impact. But I know that you, you yes. really love the topic of children at school and children at home. Can we, can we talk yeah. a bit more about it? Um, can you show us part of your conclusions of research on both? children at school and children at home? How does it play? Mm. How can we learn from that? I love that question. I mean, in my own um, sort of professional journey, uh, 
I actually started off as an organisational psychologist. My PhD was in organisational psychology and for the first 10 years of my career I was working in the business school at the university and consulting to corporates and then um, my children were born and I started taking my son to preschool, kindergarten and kind of fell in love with schools and, and the idea that why, why would I wait and work with senior level executives to teach them these principles of positive psychology when I could start with kids who are four and change the trajectory of their life. Because when I was working in the business school at the university and working with the corporates, um, that was, you know, the feedback I got from these very senior people in, in, in um, investment banking and in retail and not-for-profit humanitarian organisations was, why am I only learning this now? Why am I only learning this as a, you know, an adult in my 40s, my 50s, my 60s? It would have been so helpful if I had have had these skills at a young age. And so I had that kind of rolling around my head and my son was just about to start school. And I was very committed as a parent um, because of my own childhood and my own background to do things very differently with my own two children. And so I had already as a psychologist and a mother with my little sample size of two children, mind you, started to like find ways of introducing gratitude and character strengths and resilient thinking and mindfulness and savoring just within my own little family home. But seeing that it was working, seeing that it was working with my children. And so I started to bring that into schools and then um, having the success in schools with these various programs. And as, you know, as I said to you before, the outcomes that we were finding around higher levels of uh, life satisfaction and self-esteem, self-confidence, hope, optimism, et cetera. Um, back in 2011, yeah, I get my years confused. <laughs> I don't know about you, but as I'm getting older, it's like it's all a blur. Oh, absolutely. 2000, 2009 was actually when I first started having these conversations with Marty Seligman. He was, he was visiting um, out in Australia and, and we were at a dinner together um, at my university and we were talking about the application of positive psychology into schools, which is something that he's very committed to. And, um, and I was just talking about how I brought it into my family home. You know, he, he had done the same, particularly with his wife, Mandy, who has been a very strong advocate for the application of positive psychology in the home environment. And we started chatting about that uh, in 2011 when I saw him in Philadelphia what, what I had found in the research so far was that a lot of work was being done with kids in clinical settings. A lot of positive psychology work was being done with kids in schools, but no one was doing the research for home and family and how it is that we educate the parents around these principles so they can start to interweave it into the daily life of their home. And you know, we just know that everyone knows this intuitively and there's 50 years of research to show the, the profound impact that a parent has on not only the childhood, but the life trajectory of their sons and their daughters. Um, so I was talking to Marty about someone should be doing this research. Someone should be looking at the impact that positive psychology principles can have in family, on the mental health of the children, on the mental health of the parents, on the enjoyment levels of the parents. Cause let's face it. I mean, I, love being a mum, love it. Can't imagine my life without my two children. Um, but it doesn't mean I always enjoy the role. <laughs> it's, it's quite a challenging role to be a parent. And so how can we apply some of the principles of positive psychology to make parents engage in this role with more confidence um, and more enjoyment? And so that's that conversation with Marty back in 2009 and in 2011 sort of kickstarted me looking at sort of taking what I've been doing in schools, but then applying it into families and particularly looking at strength-based parenting and how it is that as parents, we can raise our children in a way where we are helping them to identify their unique strengths and showing them how to maximize and make the most of the inner assets that they have. You know, you've got two children and I'm sure that those children will have quite different strengths. Um, likewise with mine. So, you know, how do we uniquely tune into what is right about our children, their inherent strengths, potential? Some, for some kids, it's 
you know, their sporting ability. Some kids have an amazing artistic talent. Some kids are fantastic with music. They can kind of pick up any instrument and they learn it really, really quickly. You know, other children, it's more to do with their character. They have the they have emotional intelligence that's better than most adults, you know, that, or they have this amazing sense of justice and fairness or they're just brave sort of beyond their years or they're, they're gifted um, with IT skills or communication skills or social skills. You know, my daughter, for example, just has always been really articulate ever since she was a teeny little girl. And, and the benefit to us of that is that we didn't get much of the temper tantrums at the age of two or three, because I would say to her, use your words, explain it in words. And because she was able to explain it, she didn't have to act it out. That's not to say that she's perfect. She certainly had her share of <laughs> bad behavior as a toddler, but because she was born with this strength, you know, now she's, she's in the debating team. It's a really great quality in her. It's, to be honest, sometimes a bit frustrating at home because she's very good at debating. Um, she's very good at counter arguing and she can think on her feet with her words really, really quickly. So, but that's a strength that we're cultivating in her. So what I started to do was work with parents and, and show them how it is that they can look for signs of strengths in their children, what's unique in their children. You know, one example with my daughter is her linguistic ability. Um, my son is, he has kind of, he, he goes more towards sport and also humor. He's just funny. He seriously was born funny. And I, I remember him at seven months old trying as this little baby trying to make me laugh. Like it was like, it was there from almost from such a young age. And now that's his thing. Like he, he makes people laugh and he's really good at it. So how do we as parents identify the unique strengths and talents in our children give them confidence and then show them how to utilize those strengths to build up their mental health and to help them cope with adversity and make the most of good times. Um, so that, I guess that's the big research question. And then we've done, you know, quite an extensive research program coming out of the university of Melbourne, looking at the outcomes of strength-based parenting, um, outcomes for children themselves and teenagers and then outcome for the parents. And, and so some of the, I guess, I guess the way of summarizing what we found in, in these research programs is sort of two key themes that have come out. The first is strength-based parenting is a protective factor. And what I mean by that is that um, the teenagers and the children who report having parents who help them to see and use their strengths report lower symptoms, of depression, lower symptoms of anxiety, less stress, fewer negative emotions. And so the conclusion from that is that when you are raised with a parent who sees the good in you, when you are raised with a parent who helps you to identify and make the most of and harness your own particular strengths, that style of parenting buffers you against the kind of negative end of uh, mental illness. It, 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 it doesn't necessarily, it's not a cure-all. Strength-based parenting is not a cure-all, but you have lower levels of these things. So it, it provides a kind of buffer, a protective factor. And the second key thing that we found is that in addition to helping reduce negative states, strength-based parenting helps to reduce positive states. So it's a little bit like I was talking about with schools. And what my research program has found is that Teenagers and children who have strength-based parents have, um, they're more likely to have a growth mindset, um, meaning that they, they have an, a belief that if they work hard, put in effort, put in practice, their skills will grow, their intelligence will grow, their grades will grow, their um, social capacity will grow. They are more likely to be engaged in school. They're more likely to get better grades at school. They're also more likely to have high levels of positive emotion, self-confidence and life satisfaction. So it's a buffer. It, being a parent who helps to connect your children with their strengths helps to reduce and buffer levels of stress, anxiety, depression, but it also helps to uplift, enhance, amplify the positive end of the mental health spectrum. That's so interesting. Listening to you, um, these these uh, 
insight from Neil Donald Walsh came to my mind that basically he said that actually our kids should be raised by our grandparents instead of by us mm -hmm. as parents <laughs> because they, they know what it takes. And actually the question is, is about we have all these insights, but do we have to actually have parents as psychologists in order to move our kids to the next level? Because that yeah. it's it's kind of uh, interesting to see how we can scale the the opportunity. So, what is your recommendation when we as parents are no psychologists? How can we? Mm, I love that question. I think that's a fantastic question. And you know, in all of my years of doing strength-based parenting research and talks, no one has asked me that question. So. That must be a strength in you, your curiosity or your clear thinking, you know, that's coming through your perspective. It's coming through in, in asking that question in the first place. Um, but I'm really glad that you asked it because, you know, um, the short answer is no, you don't need to be a psychologist to do this. The, the strength-based parenting approach is, it's really about ch tuning into your kids, seeing evidence of where they get energized, seeing evidence of self-motivation. You know, what are the parts of their week that they're just choosing to do and you don't have to nag them to do that. That, that suggests that there's an underlying strength to that. Seeing evidence of high levels of performance, a strong, a fast learning curve, them performing uh, kind of above what would be expected of their age. These are, these are the three kind of signs of tuning in and seeing a strength are energy, self-motivation and performance. Um, once you see the strength, then, you know, it's, again, it's about parental wisdom of saying, well, I can see a strength of strength with words or a strength in art or a strength with creativity or a strength with technology. So what can I do as a parent to cultivate an environment um, that helps to bring out that strength, you know, connect them with the right person, connect them into the right groups, give them the right resources, praise and encourage them when I see those things. So they're, they're all just what we know actually honestly just to be good parenting you don't have to be a psychologist for that i mean one of the things that i i've certainly done is take the research and make it really applied and you know and that's through my book every every uh chapter every the end of every single chapter in my book is like how can you make this real in a busy life where where we've got multiple family members, you know, how do you, uh, what are some small practices that you can do just to start to bring this into your home, not having to be a psychologist. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, one small practice is changing the questions that you ask your children instead of sort of how was school or what was your day like today? Just ask them, you know, what strength did you use today or what strength did you see someone else use today? So, I find, um, and, a lot, and with the, the parenting programs that I run, like just ch tweaking a few little things, changing the questions that you ask, trying to bring in a what went well ritual into your family. So maybe if you eat together of an evening, <clears throat> start the dinner. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I need to have a little sip. Start your dinner with what went well for you today. Um, not every family gets to eat dinner every night. My family certainly don't. Um, maybe kind of twice, twice a week, we actually sit down as a group of four because in between work schedules and sports schedules, but finding other ways when you pick your kids up from school, when they go to bed at night, um, just starting to institute this practice of what went well, bringing in routines, um, thankful Thursdays is a, is a nice one to do. So on a Thursday, what do you feel thankful for or who do you feel thankful towards? Mindful Mondays. There's lots of like really concrete things that you can do as a parent that um, don't require you to be a psychologist and don't really certainly don't require money or resources, just little changes in practice that um, you bring into the family that change the change the climate of the family. So, yeah, like I said, my book has lots and lots of really concrete things, questions, things to put on your refrigerator, games to play, rituals to, to put in place. Um, and likewise with the, with my online course, that, that's really practical and applied. And I, I think one of the, the biggest sources of feedback actually that I've got from both the book and the online course is, and this, I love this, is parents just saying, this is really doable. Like it's doable, it's not complicated, it's achievable. 
Um, and the more that I do these things, the more confidence I'm getting as a parent, the, the happier my relationship is with my child or my son, which kind of sets up this nice upward spiral because they try one or two of the techniques and it's successful and they feel that they're doing a better job as the parent and they're getting positive responses from their kids. So then that gives them confidence to, oh, well, I tried these first two techniques. Let's try the next two techniques. So it sort of builds up this positive spiral over time. One, one final question from my side. Um, how do we make this work at the largest number of schools? Uh, do, we need, do we need a champion? Who should be the champion at the school in order to bring mm. the parents on board? Because if we know that the, the relationship between the family, parents, and the school is so important. What do we need yeah. in order to actually engage more parents? And who should be the champion mm. at this point? That's another really good question. And there's a couple of things that you can do to get better communication between the school and the family so that the, the student is having those messages taught to them at school and then reinforced at home around strengths, around gratitude, around savoring, around mindfulness. And so yes, it's always helpful to have a champion. I, I would actually say more than one champion. So clearly the headmaster, the school principal, someone who um, is endorsing this, who's putting it into their school newsletters, who's communicating with parents. Um, school psychologists, school counselors are also really good advocates to, so this is what I find, um, most parents, want to be good parents. You know, most parents love their children and want the best for their children. It's just that, you know, there's no school for parenting. I always find that fascinating. You know, I went to, I went to high, primary school and high school. Then I went on to university to do more formal learning. I had to study in order to get my driver's license. Um, at, in my professional career over the last 25 years, I've had ongoing professional development opportunities that my university pay to keep me educated for. Um, I had Lamar's classes and I got educated about the pregnancy itself and um, supposedly got educated on how to actually give birth to a child. Although any woman who's watching this will know that <laughs> what you get told is different to your experience. But there's no school for parents. You know, no one gives us any education. So although, we, although our intention is right, that the execution you know, we let ourselves down with the execution because we haven't been told we're busy, we're stressed, we have our own issues that we're working through. And so a big part of what the schools can do is to communicate, but also educate, offer education to the parents. This is, this has been one of the most heartwarming things that I've seen in my work with schools is that um, schools will bring me across and we'll run a parenting night and it's booked out. The, the lecture hall is full. In fact, in some schools, there was a school in Hong Kong that I worked with last year. They had to, re they had to ring me and say, could you stay an extra day? They had me on a Thursday evening. They said, we also need to have you on the, the Friday morning and the Friday night. There are so many parents who, want, who are just craving some form of education, some form of direction. Um, so schools, I think, play a really, that's what schools do best. They're educators. They play a really, really key role in educating the parents. So we do need the champion, as you've suggested. We need education. Um, and then, you know, there are just a lot of little ways where schools can more subtly reinforce those messages through home. And, and you know, and that's things like school diary, for example. Put, I've worked with schools who now have changed their school diary. So it's not just kind of this is the homework that's due but these are the top five character strengths of your child. Ask them what went well during the week. Here's a little mindfulness tip for you. So the school diary becomes not just a task to do for the parent, but a way of bringing these principles into family life. Um, like I said, communication with, um, with the parents. I've seen a couple of schools actually change their report card. This is brilliant. So they have the report card where they have the students' grades and progress academically on one side, but on the other side, they have teachers' observations of the character of the students. They have teachers' reports on where the students are doing well in terms of their social and emotional learning skills and what, where they might need a little bit more help. So, there, you know, there's a multiple ways in which we can 
have positive psychology as the kind of intersection between school and home. Um, but I think to your point, schools need to be doing this intentionally. They really, the schools that understand the importance of bringing the parents on board with the positive education journey, these are the schools that I've seen be the most successful in terms of the student outcomes and the students learning these lessons in a, in a way that's sustained throughout their life. Well, uh, well, uh, Lee Waters, thank you for being a front runner and for leading by example. Oh, we have to you. clone. We have to clone you. <laughs> we have <laughs> to go to all these thousands of schools around the world, and and I, I'm sure that our lives as parents would be much much better. So, um, thank you so it's much. Very kind uh, thing to say. It's amazing that you are you are always always uh, as well the president of the. International Positive Psychology Association, and and we know what your your big event coming up. So we have to yeah. read your book, go to your online um, a training, and we have to get you all over the world. So let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> well, maybe not me all over the world, but certainly um, I've got a lot of free resources on my website as well. And yes. you know, one of the things that I have done in relation to what you were just saying was, you know, how can I get the practices and the science that I've developed out to as many people as possible without me having to always travel because it's a bit of an irony that um, I'm traveling all across the world to talk to other parents and then having to leave my own two beautiful children at home. So the way that we've done that is through the online course. Um, and that's been amazingly um, just successful. We've got parents from everywhere taking that course, which is lovely. And then also, um, I'm working with trained facilitators now. So certainly if there's anyone listening to this who, who's interested in becoming a trained facilitator in any country um, who wants to connect with community and parents and bring um, the practice to them, please direct them to my website, Louise, um, strengthswitch.com, and there you can see where you apply to be a facilitator. But that's just a new thing that we're doing right now. And, and it's exactly to your point of um, how do we get my ideas and my research and my practice out to as many parents as possible um, in a way that's, you know, culturally specific um, and sensitive and in a way that allows me to keep my own energy levels, if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, uh, Lee. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, the amazing work and let's get your online trainings and everything uh, to as many people as possible. We'll be very happy to help here anyhow. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Oh my goodness. Thanks for the opportunity and good for you. I mean, it's wonderful that you're setting up this event and you're spreading the word to as many people as possible. And, and I'm just delighted to have the opportunity to be a part of it. So I, I really appreciate you thinking of me and inviting me onto the summit. Thank you so much.